Shrimatre Namaha. Namaste, everyone. A very warm, warm welcome. And so glad to see entrepreneurs, business leaders, investors uh, gather for some great lessons from our history written by none other, none other than uh, Vikram Sampath. So I've been a great fan of his writings. And uh, yes, I can't get to wait started. Vikram. So I have the same question that Madanji asked. <laughs> you know, uh, the way your journey panned out, technology, management, institution building, and history. And what is about technology management that is so attracted to history? Because it's true on my side also. <laughs> and it's true from their side. Very good evening, everyone. It's really, really so heartening to see a room full of people from the corporate sector with this amount of keenness and interest in something that is otherwise dismissed as a dry, boring subject. Uh, and to meet in a hall which probably you know, reflects that historical glory, the Vijayanagara Hall, which we were marveling the pillars uh, that are there here, uh, quite uh, reminiscent of the temples of, say, Hazara Rama or so on in Hampi. Uh, I must honestly confess, I feel like a schoolboy who's an errant schoolboy who's come back to face all his teachers because all of you being in finance and I'm a renegade who's run away from finance and after having been in the corporate sector for a couple of years, nine, ten years, which was quite a soul sapping experience personally, uh, my journey into history was completely, as I dis uh, describe it, serendipitous. Uh, it was not planned. I think sometimes the larger forces of nature, destiny, God, or whatever that you think of, that you surrender to, uh, that leads your uh, you know path, and that is. And they chose the right person. <laughs> they always choose the right people. Thank you for being kind. <laughs> so it was, you know, as a, I must confess here that as a student in Sri Aurobindo Memorial School here in Bangalore, and later at Bishop Cotton's, uh, history was one of my most hated subjects in school. Almost every uh, uh, you know, lesson in history, class in history meant kneeling down outside because I simply could not memorize who succeeded whom and which year, which battle was fought and all the other nonsensical glut that we are uh, you know, pushed down our throats in the very, very boring manner in which history is taught to us. And I really pity my history teacher who these days sees me all over as, you know, the historian that the country is reading and she must be really <laughs> either cursing herself or maybe a little bit of uh, self-guilt about, I wish I was a little kinder to this little boy. But uh, it was completely by accident that, uh, you know, uh, most of you would remember there was this serial those days on Doordarshan called The Sword of Tipu Sultan uh, by Sanjay Khan. And I think... In some way, I owe my literary career to Sanjay Khan because uh, if you remember in that serial, the Maharaja of Mysore, the Vadiyar, Immadi Krishnaraj Vadiyar, and his wife, Rani Lakshmi Ammani, they were shown in an extremely poor light. Uh, the Maharaja was shown like this obese retard who was dancing along with the court dancer. The Maharani was one of those typical, you know, vamps from the Ekta Kapoor serials who are always conspiring and conniving and all of that. And if you remember across the state, there was a lot of protest about this. Uh, because though it's been 70 years since the royal family has ceased to exist in that manner, I think the people of Karnataka, particularly southern Karnataka and erstwhile Mysore state, still hold the Vadiyar family in a lot of regard and reverence. Uh, the numerous firsts that Mysore had to its credit, the social and economic progress that this state has seen on the foundations of which modern Karnataka have been built, uh, the cultural osmosis that Mysore was, uh, and what we, the, the cosmopolitan nature that we can be so proud of today. I think a lot of that was bequeathed to us by the Vodiyars. And somewhere this apple cart seemed to have been upset by this portrayal in that serial. And as a child who, as I said, was kneeling down outside class, there was something in that serial and the protests that uh, kindled the spark inside me saying, I need to find out the truth behind this false portrayal. And I must mention here, it was never with the intention that this will become a book someday or it's going to, um, I'm going to write uh, uh, a book on the Vodaya Thang. It was just uh, a journey of discovery, uh, self-initiated, self-motivated, more importantly, self-funded. 
uh, initiative where every uh, you know vacation meant going to Mysore. We had no connection with Mysore at all uh, on neither my mother's side or my father's side, but my poor parents, every vacation meant going there, uh, meeting members of the royal family, uh, going to the palace archives, libraries, initially just about that particular king and queen. And then this madness actually continued for 10 long years, uh, even as I was doing my engineering at Bits Pilani and then my MBA in finance from SPJN. But this Mysore bug had bitten very deep. And after collecting so much of information, uh, the Wadiyas were one of the longest ruling royal houses of India. They ruled for 600 years. Uh, and it was quite, uh, you know, dispiriting to know that there was not a single book written in modern times which covered this entire uh, gamut or canvas of such a rich history of such an important part of the country. And that's another problem we can discuss about the way historiography in India is, which is so Delhi-centric, where large parts of India, particularly South India, hardly probably feature in the larger narrative of what the history of India is. So there was this uh, quote by Tony Morrison which said, if there is a book that you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, you must be the first person to write it. So, <laughs> so that was what uh, inspired me that after 10 years of gathering so much material, a lot of well-wishers then advised me that why don't you put this all together in the form of a book. And that's when, even while I was working in the corporate sector, in G Money and Citibank, and the city never slept, it never allowed us to sleep either. But despite that, uh, you know, that was when my first book came out in 2008. And so, as I said, serendipity and surrender to a larger uh, force that probably guides your life, that was what led to the start of this journey. And then one led to the other, to the other, the next book on Gohar Jan, uh, who was the first artist and woman of the subcontinent who recorded her voice on the gramophone in 1902. Again, totally forgotten, nothing known about her. Though she was from Calcutta, she died in Mysore uh, as a uh, state guest of Nalwadi Krishna Badiar in 1930. So her story became uh, a, a, a mad obsession. And so one after the other, it um, followed. And at some point, once the book started uh, taking off in a manner that I didn't expect it to, uh, I think I got the gumption to leave my corporate job where every day I was looking at Excel sheets uh, and wondering, am I going to die one day just calculating profit and loss of some American company? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thankfully, uh, very few people probably uh, have the blessing to actually make your passion your career. And I think I'm extremely grateful to the universe for granting that. And we are extremely grateful too to have blessed a historian like you and... Uh, yeah, now we know that the historian Vikram Sampath was born much before the engineering or management corporate Vikram Sampath, who had a short stint, fortunately. So, uh, yes, it's surprising to know that you, I, when I was imagining that uh, you were from Mysore or somewhere closely connected to uh, the royal family or, uh, you know, because the book on Mysore royals is so passionately written. Uh, you know, one can see the personal connection, uh, you know, in each of those, that content. And I also heard the Mysore, uh, the Odayars were also Nayakas under Vijayanagara, if I am... Uh... Yes. In fact, the name Odayar itself was given to anybody who was the lord of 33 villages. That is all that they owned initially. Uh, since the time the dynasty was started by uh, Yadu, Yaduraya in 1399, till 1610 when Raja Odayar uh, you know, assumed the throne in Sri Rangapatna and actually made it a independent kingdom which broke away after the battle of Tallikota and the decline of Vijayanagara. But till then, they were vassals of the Vijayanagara empire, like the Nayakas of Madurai, of Tanjore, Keladi and all these places, and later became an independent kingdom. Yes. Nice. So just uh, moving your journey a little forward, writing about uh, Savarkar, right? Uh, I remember uh, meeting Vikram in London, which, you know, when he had come there for to do his research, and I just got to know how deeply he goes, how rigorously he goes into all those primary sources archived in London, you know, if not in India. So how was, one thing is the historical rigor, you know, that had been sadly missing in the mainstream narratives, or we shouldn't call them mainstream now, but... Uh, you know, in the erstwhile narratives. And then 
swimming against the current because Savarkar, I think a uh, section of uh, intellectuals worked overtime in branding Savarkar, you know, towards the, you know, with a label that he didn't deserve. That's an interesting question because Savarkar, uh, again, I think is a historian's enigma. And here is a man who died way back in 1966. And as late as two days ago, uh, he raises heckles in today's Indian political discourse, where his portrait comes up at the Belga Belgavi uh, assembly um, session. Few weeks ago, Rahul Gandhi made some comment about him. Then there was again a furor. Uh, every now and then there are defamation suits filed by Savarkar's uh, grand nephew against members of the Congress. The prime minister goes to Port Blair and pays his obeisance to this man. Um, State governments spend valuable public time, money to decide whether his name should be prefixed by Veer or not and all these kind of you know, meaningless debates. But in the midst of all this noise, if a young person today, a young Indian man or woman, wants to know what is this noise all about? Who is this person? What did he stand for? And why is all this noise happening? The last biography of Savarkar was written only when he was alive uh, in the 1960s by Dhananjay Kir. And Dhananjay Kir was an acolyte, so a lot of it passes off as hagiographical content also. Uh, so from then till now, while this is a person who intrudes today's contemporary political space like few other characters of the past, whose name even makes it to election manifestos, whether we'll give him Bharat Ratna or not, so there's so little academic evaluation, there's so little scholarship or interest uh, other than rhetoric, other than preconceived ideas for and against, and I would blame both sides of the spectrum, even those who eulogize him beyond uh, a measure who have really not read about him. Here was a man who was a uh, you know, polymath in his life, uh, someone who wrote thousands and thousands of pages of literature, which largely remained confined outside. Uh, I mean, it didn't go beyond the realms of Maharashtra because he wrote in Marathi. And in my uh, maternal side being Maharashtrian, somewhere there was this in hushed voices, there was talk about Savarkar. And my first brush with him, I mean, we never read about him. I don't know how many of you here read about him in your growing up years, in your uh, textbooks and so on. I don't think even the cellular jail made too much of a uh, mention anywhere or all the other political prisoners who were there in cellular jail. And uh, regretfully, I think I heard about his name first in that movie Kala Pani. Uh, you know, otherwise, uh, if I were dependent on curricular history, he would have been uh, wiped off. I mean, you know, so for me, I think when in 2003, if you remember, there was his portrait, which was unveiled in the Central Hall of Parliament by Mr. Vajpayee's government. And there was a huge furor about that too, like what happened just two weeks ago, or two days ago, rather. And a few, uh, he'd also got a plaque, uh, you know, put at Kalapani in Port Blair. And once the government changed... You had Mani Shankar Ayer, uh, who got that displaced and had a lot of epithets to say about uh, Savarkar, very disparaging words. So I think somewhere, uh, you know, characters of the past who are either forgotten or misunderstood or maligned, uh, I strongly feel they come looking for their redemption through my pen for some reason. <laughs> so it's... It's really not something I choose to do, but it just so happens they that choose they, you. They, <laughs> yeah, it gives me some amount of humility of just being an instrument. And since then, I was mulling over this idea that I think we need to, you know, uh, put Savarkar in perspective. And it took about five, six years since 2014, 15, when I started uh, working on him. And there was a hell amount of material which was there. Like we met in London, uh, the British Library and the British Archives there. Just three weeks of staying there, I managed to gather about 40,000 pages of documents, original primary source documents, court papers, legal documents, all of which beautifully cataloged here. It's good, at least here, we would not even allow access or we would have lost it or sold it to somebody for a quick penny by the archival head or whatever. But it's all at least there. So this is available for people to access. I think his was a story that was dying to be told. Uh, and all aspects of his character, the, the polarizing nature that he's been made out to be, and the, either, as I said, the eulogy, eulogy or the demonization, both are at an extreme. And I think the sober truth of history is always in that middle path where you need to look at the pluses and minuses of any person. Nobody is shades of white uh, and black. There are more than 50 shades of gray, I think, when it comes to assessing 
the legacy of a historical character and i think savarkar deserved that since independence we have every year there's a new biography of gandhi and nehru and all these people which is good history means constantly reevaluating revisiting relooking but somehow this man though so important though the philosophy that he uh, you know popularized hindutva is so mainstream today it is in a political ascendant people did not want to analyze what were the causes of its uh, you know origin what were his thought processes what guided him instead rhetoric is all that ruled so i think somewhere to try to set that balance was how i initially with the amount of material i wanted to make it a three volume biography and then my publishers penguin came down heavily on me saying you know it's not one of amish's trilogy that you keep making one after the other so you please restrict it to two so it was a with a heavy heart it had to be cut down and even then the size is a little intimidating for many people no i mean do i my advice to the audience here is don't get uh, you know scared by the size just uh, you know uh, open the book and uh, vikram sampath will draw you with his magic in so yes talking about this whole narrative uh, you know transformation or you know unearthing the actual narrative uh how did the idea of brave hearts uh, was born and before that i want to ask uh, the audience a question how many of you have heard of the battle of tallikota that you know which that has quite a number of the, sitting in the vijayanagar hall so obviously <laughs> yeah 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 so and how many of you have heard of the battle of penna uh the guys i shared with about just before the program began are not qualified <laughs> so two hands <laughs> so two or three hands there against some 15 18 hands that went up which new vijayanagara the tadikota battle <laughs> sorry and uh, hmm, exactly exactly so and you know that's what struck me when i read about the conversation you had with sanjeev sanyal about uh, you know Let's how add two more battles to that uh, what about the battle of sarai ghat it's slightly better battle of kolachal non malayali is in the <laughs> okay that's the uh, battle of debal that you mentioned where chacha so yeah so so the genesis of this book was again again as another serendipity a series of ha- happy accidents that keep happening uh, uh, you know thanks to something else so uh, a very dear friend of mine uh, fellow author economist sanjeev sanyal um, we keep meeting often and in the course of one such conversation maybe way back in 2016 or so uh, we were just discussing like this one evening and he asked me exactly this question he said have you ever noticed that you know in all our growing up years in our history textbooks all the battles that we remember by heart are the battles that we as india and indians have lost uh, right from the myth of that aryan invasion theory to the you know battle of hydaspes where alexander and porus india lost uh, we had the arab invasion of sindh uh by we all would know mohammed bin qasim's name and 712 was the arab invasion but we probably would not know about raja dahar or about his predecessor chacha uh who actually successfully kept sindh uh, free from arab influence for about 60 70 years before it actually fell so the arab invasion the battle of tarain mohammad ghori defeats prithviraj chauhan we know all of that we know about all the three battles of panipat uh, with dates who fought who lost most often it was the indian side that lost the anglo mysore wars the anglo maratha wars anglo sikh wars battle of baksar battle of plassey you name it it's like a laundry list so somewhere subconsciously it's been dinned into our heads that we are a nation of losers we've been from time immemorial uh, our destiny is to be ruled by people from the outside that anybody who comes from the outside we just cover in front of invasions and we've been defeated from the uh as i said the aryan invasion to the greeks to hunas to shakas to uh the arabs the mongols the turks the portuguese the english east india company the french the dutch you name it and that is what it is but then we were also discussing that if we are still around as the only pre bronze age civilization 
there must have been some battles we won also poor things and we must have put some courage and resistance and f- fight back and so on so where are those stories where are those heroes and more importantly heroines there were lots of women also in this long list where are their stories in this long litany of our historical narrative that is dinned down to in our into our heads and we tried to ask each other like the quiz that pop quiz we did now that can you name 10 battles which india won or 10 such uh, heroes and despite being historians history buffs and so on it was very difficult to come up with that, those names and that's when the idea of this book germinated in my head again accidentally that i think this is a this is also a story that is dying to be told uh, and coupled with this several other problems as i saw it in the way indian historiography well, it has numerous problems but then some others which uh, are very rife what i alluded to in the first answer that it's highly highly delhi centric uh, everything about india is somehow conflated the story of delhi conflates to the story of india um, for obvious reasons it's a political capital all the big wigs are there and all of that the media attention is also so incommensurate uh, you know i've constantly said that the northeast or assam can go down under floods uh, bangalore can have so many problems that, that doesn't make so much uh, impact in the national media as some mcd polls i mean it's a municipal polls for god's sake i mean that doesn't have to become national news and people debating about it we don't even care for the last two years we don't have an elected council in the bbmp but this becomes so important some fellow throws something on somebody in some jnu or some small little university which is just one other university among 800 universities but that becomes national news so similarly in history too we all would be asked to learn by rote um, the uh, succession lines of the tughlaqs and khiljis and lodis and all of these people whose i think contribution to this country or our civilization is quite negligible barring a few uh, you know architectural structures here and there and they were bigots and marauders and invaders largely but we still have to learn about them but if we ask a young child if we ask our own children can you name five chola kings uh, who ruled almost for 1000 years or go to the northeast uh, again a black hole we don't even know what are the i mean even now even in our growing up years right when we would mark it on the map i don't know how many of us would actually know how to demarcate all the seven now eight states of the northeast with their capital it was just beyond bengal it was just one black hole which we didn't understand how these people lived but these are eight very different vibrant societies indigenous communities the ahoms of assam again like the wadiyars ruled for 600 years but do we know the names of one or two ahom kings we wouldn't but ibrahim lodi or bakhtiyar khilji mohammed bin tughlaq these are all they immediately ring a bell and the mughals of course get a lot of attention even in the way our textbooks are written so that was another thing that i tried to balance out in this book uh, the 15 people i chose i chose them from across india uh, particularly regions which are neglected uh, by the larger mainstream main, what is called mainstream historiography all of this is clubbed as regional stories if you go to the ncrt book too cholas pallavas pandyas shatavahanas all these people are disposed of in one map uh, saying this is where they ruled and so on and these are regional stories chhota mota idhar udhar ka you know some empire what is mainstream is three chapters on the mughals i not for one saying you know remove anyone or excise anyone from our history a lot of claims even in our state tipu sultan should not be a part of the textbook i think that is foolish you can't choose your past uh, whether you like it or not you have to the good bad and the ugly of the past you have to let your next generation know but there has to be a commensurate representation of all parts of india uh, and when you say history of india every part of india needs to have a voice there i think the uh, history of bharat needs to snatch back her narrative from delhi and the clutches of delhi and that's what i've tried to do by balancing this out so from lalita ditya mukta pida of the karkota dynasty of kashmir i don't know if uh, we've ever heard of either this dynasty or this man uh, from him to rani naiki devi of gujarat rana kumbha of rajasthan uh, kanho ji angre of maharashtra rani abbakka from our own state from ullal uh, martand varma from kerala velu nachiyar and the rajendra chola from tamil nadu rudrama devi of warangal banda singh bahadur of punjab uh, lachit barpu khan from assam Rajarshi Bhagyachandra Jay Singh of Manipur 
uh, and uh, Begum Hazrat Mahal of Lucknow, Awadh, and uh, Chand Bibi of Ahmednagar. These were the 15 people. <laughs> Thank you. And another important thing which I am very, very, uh, you know, passionate about that in this history, which always becomes his story, I think her story also needs to uh, be very, very prominent. And uh, yeah, when I was signing books also, I was asking Rajesh that I was looking for just so few women names <laughs> in the books that I signed. And I was so happy to see a few of them, which I signed for. So seven, at least here, there is no women's reservation bill needed. In this book, out of 15, I thought seven need to be women and eight uh, men in the narrative. That's wonderful account. Uh, because each of the uh, accounts given in this book is so mesmerizing and uh, it is so different from the boring Wikipedia style, uh, you know, recounting of history and uh, we can't even trust Wikipedia these days, uh, you know, because so unscientifically things get edited. And uh, then speaking about those, uh, the Aryan invasion theory uh, that I just, you know, wanted to share my side of experience. Uh, that's because researching for my novel, Avishi, made me realize how unscientific that that theory is because I started out with a very open mind and a clean state uh, thinking if if I'll go through all those historical papers or whatever and if AIT, uh, the Aryan Invasion Theory is true, let me go with it. But then I found out that uh, the archaeological, when we get down to the bricks, the archaeological proof of this theory is just some 27 skeletons found somewhere, Mohenjo-daro or somewhere. And some German historian stood there and said, this is the crime of Lord Indra. And that became a, you know, that actually became an academic statement. Okay, Germans, I don't expect Germans to do justice to Indian history. And But what the hell was wrong with our historians that they totally lapped up that, uh, uh, you know, that side of the theory. So... Uh, it's the unscientific nature of the so-called Delhi-centric narratives is so striking and uh, that brings me, but that also brings me to the fact that a lot of sources quoted in the book are by medieval foreign travelers, Marco Polo, Petro della Valle and, uh, you know, a lot of those and they seem to have given certain honest accounts and uh, but weren't there uh, local accounts, uh, Vikram, other than those inscriptions? Uh, you know, the inscriptions is something he has gone through very deeply. Uh, so that's uh, that's something which I really, really liked. Uh, yeah. But uh, how about Indian accounts, Indian narratives that you would have found in your course of yeah. research? So, you know, after those two heavy volumes of Savarkar, my publishers, you know, I keep saying this, that they conned me into this book, saying, you know, uh, do a quick, quick book, you know, just churn out 15 stories only, it'll get over very soon, you can write it, it should be thin, people can pick it off uh, the airport uh, bookstore and read it over a flight and not use it as dumbbells during the lockdown period, which is what I think those two volumes helped uh, many people with. So I got conned into it. I said, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good, I also need a little bit of a break. But little did I realize that it would be 15 times more difficult than Savarkar, not for the length of the uh, written material, but just access. Because so few, as these, as I said, many of these names, Hazrat Mahal, etc., we may have heard those names. But I'm, I must tell you, even in Lucknow, people go to Hazrat Ganj and have that uh, uh, papri chart there, but they really don't know much about Begum Hazrat Mahal or after whom it was named. So, uh, our, but it's a, it's a myth, Sai Swarupa, that we as Indians did not keep accounts. Uh, which is constantly told to us. Uh, again, by the way, the, uh, people from outside saw us. They said, you know, right from Albaruni, who said the Hindus have no sense of history or no sense of account, keeping a, a record, to the British, who, of course, spoke very, very disparagingly of our uh, record keeping. You go to Kashmir, uh, Kalhana and the Raja Tarangini that he wrote. It's a fabulous description of the entire Hindu past of Kashmir till about the 13th century, which in detail, 
postulates all the rulers whom we we first of all don't even imagine that there was a hindu past to kashmir we are so caught up with today's controversies and demographics and problems uh, come down south the cholas they were magnificent record keepers uh, uh, most often the same information would be kept multiple copies of be it on temple inscriptions be it uh, coins be it palm leaf manuscripts in multiple languages the same thing told in tamil as well as in sanskrit uh the brihadeshwara temple for instance the big temple in tanjavur has inscriptions of about 400 500 devadasis who were performing uh, you know daily services for the brihadeshwara their names their emoluments their mothers names their addresses all of that actually etched on the walls of the temple you go to distant northeast to uh, assam uh, the uh, the from 4th century bce the as as asamis or the homias have documented history maintained and from 1200 uh, the 1200s when the ahoms came to power for 600 8 700 years what are known as the buranjis they are meticulous catalog of the political social cultural history of assam so north south east west there is there is documentation there is it may not be in the manner that the west looks uh, at history or at documentation itself in fact in the prologue uh, i start off with what we are talking of indic thoughts so what is the indic thought for history what did how did our ancestors perceive history as there is a beautiful shloka which is attributed to kalhana usually dharmartha kama mokshanam upadesha samanvitam katha yuktam puravrittam itihasam ta chakshmate uh, the puravrittam or the narratives of the past told to you in a katha yuktam or a story format with an upadesha samanvitam there has to be a didactic element there has to be a moral fabric and advice to society how to live life all those type of things in the larger attainment of the four purusharthas of dharma artha kama and moksha that is called itihasam tat chakshmate itihasa also translating to it thus happened and so our puranas the mahabharat the ramayana all of them are termed as itihasa in that there is a lot of fantastic stories there are a lot of tales of uh, asuras and yakshinis and gandharvas and all these even kalhanas rajatarang rajatarangini all kinds of you know fanciful stories are there when lalita ditya came towards the south on his dakshina patha then the mighty vindhyas actually bowed down like a hunched back woman and made path for him and all these kind of you know poetic license which is probably not how the west would look at documenting history but in the middle of all these stories in the middle of all these fanciful tales i think there's a kernel of truth which one needs to extract and i think our ancestors always believed in that that we don't give the knowledge very easily to the seeker you have to work hard to get it uh you know we say that in 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 any field you say, you take it i mean even in the uh, field of vedic mathematics as they call it everything is in the form of shlokas and kavyas the important of the kavi in the indic imagination the importance of mahakavyas even the the itihasas were written as mahakavyas so was rajatarangini all of that so mathematics is also that way history is also that way we say the sulba sutras uh, inspired pythagoras theorem but if you actually go there directly it will not be told to you a square equal to b square plus c square and the right angle and hypotenuse square all of that easily will not be told to you there will be some poetry and from that you extract the kernel now for those of you i know sai swarupa is also into shri vidya practice so for those of people who are into the shakta tradition even the 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 pinnacle of the shakta tradition which is the panchadashi or the shodashi mantra it is not given directly but someone who knows it if you take the lalita trishati and you take the first syllable of every bunch of verses and you join all of that you actually get the panchadashi so it's all like a puzzle that you need to work but no one is going to come and tell you that directly you discover it in the process so same way even with history but the uh, we've always derided it it's not got its due the manner it needs to so i think india our ancestors we always had a very unique philosophy on every aspect of our, of life and so also history and now the time has come to at least investigate we may we may dismiss it off later saying this is also yet another bunkum or whatever but at least let there be that uh, effort to to study to reinterpret these the problem has been one is a colonial hand down 
uh, which uh, you know there's that famous um, you know Macaulay's minutes, of course, which talks of how the entire role of English education is just to create this vast group of interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, who are Indian in blood and color, but they are English in taste, opinions, matter, um, matters of intellect and everything, morals and intellect. So I think we've imbibed that so deeply. And we've all also been constantly told that. There was John Strechy, who was the head of the civil administration, uh, ICS, Imperial Civil Service, who in his lectures, the first thing he would tell the students, aspiring civil servants, including several Indians, the first thing you need to know about India is that there never was and there never is an India. That we created this nation. It was never even a concept of a nation or a rashtra. And that it was the British who gave you the sense of nationhood and gave you education, culture, railways, hospitals, etc., etc. So, And that thing has certainly, somewhere subliminally, I think if you honestly, you know, ask your conscience. A lot of us, uh, educated elite of this country also somewhere believe in that uh, subliminally, uh, which is unfortunately not true. But, uh, you know, and after independence, when this thing could have been corrected, I think the sad part is we missed the bus at that time, where uh, ideological hold over history, particularly by a dispensation, uh, and I'll name it as the Marxist leftist historiography, I think continued this sense of uh, you know loathing self loathing looking at yourself with uh, that heen bhavna inferior inferiority complex and mind you the uh, history uh, or the role of a historian is not to stir up jingoism and you know beat your chest and say mera bharat mahan everything about our past is golden and all that but then genuine reasons to be proud of genuine achievements of our ancestors in 5000 8000 years of our documented existence what is it that our ancestors did? What was our contribution to the corpus of world knowledge? What is it that we can be genuinely proud of as Indians? That somehow doesn't make it to the way history is handed down to us or told to us. And I think that has happened over the span of 70, 75 years now. And now slowly there are little shoots of change that are coming up amidst this large debris. Wonderful. Now... We know Sorry, the kind very of long answer. no the I mean it's perfectly enjoyable. Now we know the kind of fascination that drives the rigor behind uh, Vikram's research. Uh, that I personally find it so inspiring. You know to you know I'll remember it and apply it while researching for my own book. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, coming to this, uh, you know, I was just reminded of this uh, shloka from Vishnu Purana, which defines. India, because we are again so uh, fixated about Western definitions of a country or a civilization which are physical borders ruled by so and so monarchy or something. And uh, Vishnu Purana, after that very popular Uttaram Yat Samudrasya, uh, where you know where the land between Himalayas and the uh, and the sea is uh, called Bharata, and then it lists down the kingdoms, some 20, 30 Janapadas that existed during the time where Vishnu Purana was composed. But why are all the people called Bharati? Because they are guided by common principles. They do yagna, that is, you know, they make the ahuti of their earnings for a larger cause. And they do dana. And munis, they practice mauna. Mauna is not silence, but it is contemplation. So we are uh, pursuing dharma, artha, kama, so that we all achieve moksha across these kingdoms. And, uh, you know, that made me wonder, uh, slightly off note, uh, one of my colleagues at my university, he's into international relations, he keeps attending these strategic conferences. And a common question he gets asked is by the foreign, not historians, the, all the international relations guys is, how on earth is Sri Lanka an independent nation for last 75 years? You know, it doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make cultural sense. And it doesn't make any sense. Had it been China, it would have just annexed, like the way it has been annexing Mongolia, Manchuria, whatever. Uh, and uh, Rajendra Chola had that vision it was he, his vision was not that of a con, just a conqueror's vision. His vision was 
something about uh, unifying this administration over common cultures right and that brings me it's all uh, you know the glory of uh, our ancestors is not limited just to valor on the battlefield while it was a great portion their administrative abilities their vision their uh, way of executing the vision like you have rightly highlighted the cholas and i am uh, personally fascinated by ahilya bai holkar who went about renovating temples beyond her uh you know her uh, reign her kingdom so uh any interesting discoveries that you made about the administrative side leadership side that might make sense to uh, corporate leaders that you know a lot of these uh, we were just talking to madan just before we started that you know as part of this aspen global leadership program and we it was it's a international program for several um, thought leaders from various fields and so on and it's a two year program and from people from various nationalities now we feel so neglected as indians we started off the program with that film gandhi by attenborough and we have seen it i think a million times every gandhi jayanti and everything it's been running on doordarshan so often that we know it frame by frame so that barring that in the two year course there was nothing at all about uh, india or indian thought leadership or leadership models or you know administration whatever else and as madan mentioned in his opening uh, remarks too what was our answer in those several thousands of years of our existence what was our contribution to this global knowledge and why is it not documented or made accessible to us or to the outside world uh, and in the course of this uh, book and its research that's that something that came across in numerous ways Uh, i saw that there was an indic perspective to what even conquest actually meant uh, of course there was bloodshed as all you know violent wars and battles are there would be uh, invasions and killings and all of those things but after a king uh, you know occupies another territory uh, what does he do with one is of course the opponent and things that matter to the opponent whether it is deities that the opponent worships or even the scholars that the opponent uh, you know defies as uh, you know the the important elements of his or her, his court so lalita ditya mukta pida who was called the second samudra gupta of india uh, he has a digvijaya campaign according to kalhana across india and lot of fantastic stories that he even came down south as i said dakshina patha went below the vindhyas conquered karnataka by defeating the rashtrakutas all that is a little bit of bunkum because we it, it's not true then he also went to the tamil land and crossed over occupied sri lanka so his kashmir is not the geographical boundary boundary of kashmir state we see today but almost the whole of the indian subcontinent that was the picture he painted not completely true partially there are archaeological evidences to show uh, you know the the kashmir empire spread almost to the western side with uh, you know afghanistan and all those places and also um, gujarat rajasthan punjab that entire region went all the way to bihar bengal madhya pradesh all these parts were parts of the kashmir empire but each time he defeated someone like say yashovarman of kanauj from that particular court he would take away all the scholars and poets and literateurs and all of them and taking them back to the kashmir court there was bhavabhuti a sanskrit poet there was uh, atri gupta who was the uh, grandfather of abhinava gupta who later establishes the kashmir uh, shaivism kashmir tantra school vigyana bhairava tantra and all these different tantric uh, you know philosophies that originated in kashmir it was because kashmir had become such an important epicenter not only of phys- you know physical uh, enlargement over a huge empire but also the importance of you as a kingdom was indexed by what was the knowledge you produced what was your scholarship quotient uh, how many intellectuals you had in your court and so that came down even i mean even through the vijayanagar times there were contests between kingdoms right a scholar would come to your kingdom and the entire honor of that kingdom would be at stake if you did not answer a puzzle or something like that so this intellectual jostling was as important as material comforts building opulent palaces large temples all that was important but i think this very important uh, element of how the indic vision of what a digvijaya meant uh, was that 
along with the material, the intellectual should coexist. And somewhere we have lost sight of that uh, today, where it's only material pursuits which seem to matter. So Lakshmi and Saraswati, despite their fights, somehow we need to put them in the same room to coexist. Uh, so that is that was something that our uh, ancients tried and achieved. Uh, the Cholas too, you mentioned, they went and conquered Sri Lanka, Maldives, and even Sri Vijaya, uh, you know, 14 ports in Sri Vijaya, which is in the Malay Peninsula, was attacked by Rajendra Chola in 1025 CE. But then we never colonized those places. We never sent a governor, a Tamil governor, who went all the way and sat there. But then local somebody else from the collateral line of the vanquished would be placed as the ruler. There would be a revolt and something would happen. But our the, the emphasis there was always only on the, um, the trade, on the, the trade benefits that the two uh, places could get and also cultural imprint, which is why today after so many centuries, we still have Southeast Asia having such a visible Hindu and Tamil influence in all those places, uh, despite a lack of colonization uh, that we did. So there are a lot of these, I think, very important frameworks. You mentioned Ahilya by Holkar. A kind of fascinating story of a young woman who uh, did not come from a royal family. In fact, her father-in-law, uh, Malhar Rao Holkar, he himself was from a shepherd community, later rose in ranks, became, uh, you know, the apple of the eye of the Peshwa, and he got uh, the region of Malwa and Indore. And once he's just going from one place to the other, stays over at a hut somewhere, and then in a village, and there he comes across this young girl who's probably seven or eight years old, and he's so taken in by her knowledge, the way she conducts herself, that he asks for her, her hand in marriage for his son, Khande Rao. And then he gets her married and brings her back to Indore. And here is a father-in-law who ensures that uh, the daughter-in-law gets complete education. Uh, she is trained in all matters of administration, finance, accounts, everything is taught to her. Uh, he discusses statecraft, politics, even at the heights of the third battle of Panipat, which, of which he's, uh, you know, part of, there are copious amounts of letters in the Maheshwar archives where father-in-law and daughter-in-law are talking, the son is ignored. And the son is a wayward guy, he's uh, gallivanting with several other women and all that. So I think even the father does not take him too seriously. And uh, he dies uh, in a battle, uh, Khande Rao. And he has eight or nine other wives who all commit sati. But uh, Malhar Rao prevails on Ahilya Bai saying, you should not commit sati, you are the backbone of my uh, uh, kingdom. And she does not commit. And then she, uh, once the father-in-law dies, she says, I am going to take over. And her son also passes away, a very difficult personal life. But then she takes over as the woman ruler of Indore. And those years following that become the golden period of Indore's history. Even today, the Indore airport is named after her. She's called Punya Shlok, uh, Ma, Ma Ahilya Bai. And more than, of course, a very, very benevolent administration. How do you even treat uh, convicts with a lot of concern, with a lot of maternal uh, you know, care, give them a chance to reform? We talk of jail reforms and all of that now, but can we take a leaf out of Ahilya Bai's administrative uh, records? How do you tax benevolently for all the finance professionals? How do we do that? Maybe she has a little bit of an answer there somewhere. Today we are fighting about uh, places of worship act, which temple to renovate, what to do, etc. Here was a lady who understood what were the civilizational markers of India. And so all the 12 Jyotir Lingas, all the seven Puris, as mentioned in the Garud Purana, and all the Char Dhams, she got those renovated, and these were scattered across the length and breadth of India. Uh, from Kashi, we know only that she renovated the Kashi Vishwanath Mandir and the Somnath Mandir, but from Kashmir to Rameshwaram to Kamrupa to Dwarka, she kind of unified the whole country in this, uh, in this uh, you know, string of peity, of devotion, of a spiritual renaissance. And I thought that's why her inclusion was very important in this, because to be a brave heart, uh, you don't always have to don an armor and jump into the battlefield and kill people and that's important. But then along with that, at a time when your society is decadent, how can you be a brave heart who brings about a civilizational renaissance among your society? Uh, and what are the things that you do there? Uh, so that I think is so important. And so Ahilya Bai was, uh, her inclusion was uh, to, for me very, very important. Very, very fascinating nuggets of 
how including you know she she used to place water in different parts of indore so that the birds and the street dogs could come and have water in the hot months that kind of maternal care not only for human beings but all living beings uh, you know as your as the ruler you have to be the mother uh, you have to have that maternal concern for every li- living being in your kingdom uh, so i think a lot of these learnings uh, would make a lot of sense to people today and even in the battle sai swarupa there were some heroes who i saw here lachit barphukan this that's, man who that's my next question actually so we i mean uh, my thoughts about ahilya bai was that she is the real shivakami of the real mahishmati if you have you know remember the bahubali <laughs> character i mean a person who actually walked in the path of shiva while you know true, today also that. you have the maheshwari sadis Uh, uh which uh, was something that she patronized by bringing a lot of weavers uh, and the maheshwari uh, sarees that became popular were thanks to her and so i think your earlier question is there a sense of bharat uh, there, is that only political boundaries uh, what i think adi shankaracharya did some thousand years before her uh, she did it in a different way uh adi shankara also was from the small little village in uh, kerala kaladi and then he i think passed away in his early 30s and he could have just remained in his little village and done whatever philosophy that he uh, did but he went across the length and breadth of india and the and his campaign also mind you was called digvijaya lalita aditya's political conquest is also digvijaya and adi shankara's conquest to conquer people through intellect through discourse through debate through convincing that mandana mishra uh, episode of the long debates he had with him to make people come to your viewpoint or you get defeated that is also a digvijaya and he there was no reason for him to uh, erect those mathas in the four cardinal points north south east west from shringeri to dwarka to badrinath to puri he could have just remained in kerala and then he established the final peetha in uh, kashmir which is the sarvagnya peetha or the all knowing peetha uh, with the presiding deity as goddess sharada and the script is also sharada there so highlighting that this landmass uttaram yat samudrasya himadrashchaiva dakshinam varsha tad bharatam nama bharati yatra santati so that landmass has a sacred geography and a civilizational consciousness which goes beyond political borders now political borders will keep changing 5 years ago andhra pradesh was one today we have telangana andhra pradesh uttar pradesh was one we have multiple things there now all of that usa was not what it was 300 years ago uh, and it is different now india itself uh, had different parts of the subcontinent uh before 1947 so political borders can keep on changing but civilizational consciousness that this is one one nation and you know as our ancestors saw it and each time shankaracharya went to these places he was not faced with opposition saying you are coming into a different country how dare you enter you are from kerala so you cannot come into assam this is a uh, enemy territory there was that commonality and which is what perhaps ahilya bai 1000 years later understood and reinvented that wheel so to say you know uh, bringing together we were by then she was in the 18th century at the heights of uh, you know british colonialism was just setting root we were losing battles and all of that in the middle of that how to resurrect ourselves civilizationally i think that is what she attempted yeah in these days where sustainability is the new buzzword uh, that the west has discovered uh, i think we had someone who was practicing it and you know causing transformation in those times and also i was struck by uh, lachit borpukhan and uh, you know another ruler uh, who banda singh bahadur right and uh, these are the two like ahilya bai holkar they did not have a royal background and they built from you know nothing built from scratch and uh, they left this mark on history so how was their trajectory and uh, also it kind of uh, defies some of the erstwhile narratives that it's you know caste and uh, you know what all that uh, upward mobility is not yeah, possible yeah 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 something like that even upward mobility even rudrama devi's father was uh, supposedly a shudra who you know who took over the region of uh, andhra krishna godavari from hyheas yeah. so <coughs> 
It was always there, but these two uh, figures really intrigued me. Assam itself for me was a huge discovery. Like most of you here, I, I knew very little about Assam or its history. But this was one region and that again is a larger part of the Northeast, not just the today's contours of what Assam is. It was never, it was almost invincible for most of its documented history. And some of the biggest invaders, conquerors who tried to subjugate it, failed miserably when they came to Assam. Maybe it was the blessings of Goddess Kamakya there or whatever it was. Uh, you know, you had Bhaktiar Khilji who goes on this mad marauding spell, uh, goes to Bihar, uh, vandalizes all the great universities there, Nalanda, Vikram Shila, all of that. Yeah, I mean, when Nalanda burned for six months, apparently uh, manuscripts kept... Uh, the smoke kept going up for six months. That amount of knowledge lost there in just that one plunder. And uh, then he occupies Bengal. Then he goes to Assam. And he thinks now this is one small little place. It was called Kamrupa then. And so we'll occupy it. But when he goes there, the king there follows this thing, called, uh, this policy of scorched earth policy. Where, you know, you burn all the vegetation and dry up irrigation, um, you know, water bodies on the way so that the enemy uh, forces are starved and also thirsted. So it came to such an extent, he came with about 12,000 uh, soldiers, horses, all of that to, uh, to Assam. And this is the 30, early 13th century. And they didn't have anything to eat and drink and they didn't, they didn't realize this kind of resistance. And then he literally had to kill some of his own horses, eat them to survive, even that was not enough. Then they hole up in a little temple uh, ruins and before they realize, the Assamese are making a stockade around the temple and that's when in fright, Bhaktiar Kelji uh, runs, runs away from Assam who has had so many successes till then. Uh, but these people also, the other problem with a lot of Indian warriors is what Savarkar used to call as Sadguna Vikriti. Uh, you know, you unilaterally follow all the great uh, uh, ideals of warfare. After sunset, we will not fight. Uh, we will not attack, uh, you know, unarmed. We will not attack uh, women, children, disabled, old people, all these people. Uh, we will follow all the unwritten codes of uh, ethics of warfare. There's no book which tells that, but it's understood right from Mahabharata times. Once the Shankhanad is over, the war is over for the day. And if there's a retreating enemy, we will not attack them. But you know what Savarkar said? And was actually that even during the Mahabharata time, there were instances where they fought through the night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Thanks to Krishna and his other techniques there. But that's another issue. But, uh, but so Savarkar's uh, postulation was that we lost several wars because we unilaterally followed these great virtues thinking someone somewhere is going to give us a medal for that. But we were the losers. Because your opponent is following none of that. Uh, your places of worship, your women, your children, everything is par for the course. So unilaterally, if you are great, uh, it really doesn't help anybody. But the Assamese, the retreating army of Bhaktiar Khilji, maybe the Rajputs would not have fought with them. But they made mincemeat of them. So from 12,000, I think some 200, 300 managed to run, uh, you know, fighting for their life back to Bengal. So that spirit was there in the Assamese, the local, you know, the subaltern, the underdogs who are constantly fighting. They just had a lot of timber in the forest. Uh, the Brahmaputra was there, so they used the timber to make boats. They understood what their strengths were. They would draw the enemy down to their area of strength and the weakness of the enemy. Very important, I think, uh, case study, a management B-school lesson, perhaps, that when David and Goliath fight, uh, what happens to the underdog? How does the underdog uh, fight? And that's what prevailed even during uh, Lachit Barpokan's time, which was this 1640, 50, that is the time, when a lot of Western Assam was temporarily occupied by the Mughal forces, first by Shah Jahan, uh, he sends Mir Jumla to occupy it, and then Aurangzeb, of course, comes with. He sends one of the largest imperial armies of the country then, uh, under a, a Hindu ruler uh, against Hindu, uh, you know, kings of the Ahoms in Assam, uh, Raja Ram Singh of Jaipur, uh, almost like, you know, to give him, it's like a punishment posting. Uh, there was 
apprehension that Raja Ram Singh had helped Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj escape from the Agra prison. So uh, he had to fix him somewhere. So he sent him to go there. Those tribals will kill you anyway. And if you get some positive results, then that's a plus for me only. So he sent him with the largest army that goes there. And the kind of uh, things that I discovered, the way the Ahoms built their army from scratch, uh, how this national fervor of in every little, uh, every person from the gardener to the uh, cook to the ruler to the military general, everybody had to have only this single-minded focus of how do we protect our honor and get back our kingdom that we have lost. So that was something that Lachit Barphukan, he was not a king, he was the general, army general of the Ahom Raja, Jayadvaj Singha and then Chakradvaj Singha, two names of Ahom rulers, uh, which we can, uh, you know, probably flaunt when someone asks us. So this man rebuilt this army and what happened in the Battle of Sarai Ghat uh, in 1671, where this mighty Raja Ram Singh's army was completely, completely devastated by playing to your strengths and to the detriment of your enemy's shortcomings, using naval uh, strategies which they did not know of, using uh, you know all the forest and all of that which you knew better of, and then throwing them out. And Raja Ram Singh never returned, and Assam by and large remained independent. Similarly, you had Banda Singh Bahadur, who establishes the first ever Sikh state, uh, a disciple of Guru Govind Singh. The kind of tortures that the Sikh gurus have endured uh, we don't talk about that too often from Teg Bahadur, Guru Teg Bahadur to Guru uh, Arjun Dev to Guru Gobind Singh. I think next in next two days or something, there is this martyrdom day of Guru Gobind Singh's two young sons, Zoravar and somebody else, I forget the name, who were actually Divar uh, uh, Mechunwadi live. They were uh, etched inside the wall and killed by uh, the Mughal. Yeah, seven and nine year old, only because they did not uh, agree to convert. So, uh, Banda Singh Bahadur, who is again, uh, his story is, is quite fantastic. I'd let you read it. I won't let out the, this thing. But he takes it on himself to avenge all these insults to his gurus and to the faith. He's actually a Hindu initially. He later becomes a, he's a, he's a tantric, he's a mystic. He's so taken in by Guru Gobind Singh and becomes his Banda. Uh, and then goes on this, again, motley crowd of, Sikhs from all over the today's Pakistan, Afghanistan, Punjab, that area, and they vanquished the mighty Mughals during Aurangzeb's time, post that, uh, and with the, all the confusion in the Mughal uh, succession lines after that, and they established 70 years before Maharaja Ranjit Singh established his empire, you had the first Sikh state, the first coins minted and all of that. So a lot of these stories, I think, uh, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, how does the underdog survive, perform, and actually outperform uh, the bigger power? I think these would make very good models and role models for several of us. That's very inspiring. And uh, yeah, a lot of uh, lessons to learn for the people in business, even people in education, uh, uh, to learn from the underdog. Uh, maybe calling them underdogs is a disservice because they are innovators. They are real grassroots innovators. And uh, one more interesting thing you mentioned about the naval uh, uh, strategies of uh, Lachit Borpukhan's army. And uh, that uh, brings me to the Wonder Woman, Abaka Devi of Ulal. Uh, I heard that uh, her ships had the Italian technology, which was you know, far superior to the Portuguese ships and uh, there's a local legend about her which goes about saying with the you know she traveled in a single ship and destroyed a whole uh, fleet of uh, portuguese i think this is the second abaka if i'm uh, you know if i'm uh, uh, and uh, she also used the use of technology that comes to mind when we think of uh, abaka those flamed arrows tute and uh, uh, things because that's one another misunderstanding that we never had technology and uh, they came with cannons and uh, you know whatever and uh, it's true also but then they, they were these indigenous uh, you know uh, models of warfare so abaka there were not one but actually four four abakas uh, and they were called in the collective as abaka devi aru uh, in karnataka and coastal areas and like the Kantara film, you had the Bhuta Aradhane, where even Abbaka is invoked in several of these performances, in Yakshagana, 
in bhuta kola and all of that yeah i think some abakka dharaka in the siri padane siri padane yeah, yeah. i think uh, yeah, that's yeah, uh, yeah. okay so while mainstream uh-huh. history and historians may have forgotten she still survives in coastal karnataka in ullal in banga and all these places bangadi uh, raja bangarasa and all those names are very much part of the local folklore there and the second abakka as you mentioned uh, when there was this huge build up of portuguese fleet around mangalore uh, devices this very indigenous uh, you know uh, technology if you can call it the coconuts were so a plenty so the chippu of the coconut you just carve it out and in that the all the madhu was the ammunition was put in and in the dark of the night these were uh, lit and when the enemy did not know hundreds of these uh, grenades uh, local made grenades were hurled at the portuguese fleet and the entire portuguese fleet uh, is supposed to have caught fire several people were killed and why we know that this was a legit story is that uh, we have a documented uh, record uh, that this story went all the way even to the emperor of persia who talks about this in his court and there is a man who's a traveler uh, called pietro della vel uh, who's an italian traveler who hears this in the persian court and he's constantly traveling across the world like marco polo and others so he comes to india and among other places he particularly wants to come to ullal and meet this lady who affected such a huge campaign and i managed to you know source some of his first person accounts and you get a very rich image of how abakka was as a like you know what we st- spoke about ahilya bai uh, a woman monarch how did she uh, how did she interact with people so he he comes looking for her and he, of course his narrative is very skewed by the colonial uh, white man's eye he was expecting some beautiful queen and he says oh my god i was so dispirited to see this dark corpulent obese woman she was not even wearing an upper garment and she was walking with just two three people with her in the bazaar and few people were doing salam and then suddenly she comes there she says oh this guy is a white skinned guy who is he what's he and she makes some inquiries and through a translator someone tells this is so and so and then he says i've traveled all over the world to arabia to this that egypt and i've come to india and she again maternal concern uh, asked through the translator have has he had a lot of heart breaks uh, romantic failures which is why travel is usually the balm to the uh, broken heart and that's why uh, you're going all over the place he said no your majesty no 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 and this is his personal account he writes all this he says my image of this ugly woman suddenly changed because she had this maternal concern for a foreigner who not even her citizen or her subject and then he says no 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 i'm fine i'm i've had a happy domestic life or whatever and then he says but who is traveling with you uh, says, nobody i'm traveling alone so what if you fall sick if you get uh, some incurable disease or someone attacks you who will take care of you so he very uh, you know hotly says i believe in jesus christ and he is going to take care of me and all of that so okay chalo if that is what you think then so be it but then that entire episode itself showed how a woman rulers uh, you know the warmth and affection even for a foreign subject was and so through all these different so folklore you asked earlier about sources so folklore through those bhuta radhana you can't take them all at face value there's a lot of fantasy again kalhanas uh, you know taking out the kernel from the fantastic stories but triangulating it with as much written documentation as is possible to make a living narrative is i think very important wonderful so two last questions before i open the floor i am sure uh, you know they must be having a lot of questions uh, to ask you uh run us through your process of research uh, when you select a subject and uh, how does a typical day of vikram sampath look like <laughs> <laughs> very chaotic <laughs> but that's the beauty now of being my own boss and you know i don't have to as i said look at excel sheets anymore so it's largely my own uh, the way i can structure it myself but research i think that's a beauty it's almost like investigative journalism like a sherlock holmes discovery of the truth and somewhere i see that was how this journey began with that mysore uh, journey like let us find the truth as i see it i mean there there is one absolute truth but there are multiple paths to it and all historians need to have that immense humility 
that they are looking at a very warped version of that truth. Uh, it is not what I say is the definitive account. Uh, because the beauty of the subject, the beauty of the, the intellectual vigor and rigor of the subject is that today I may have written what may be called a very well-researched book on say Savarkar. Tomorrow someone else uh, undertakes that job. Maybe I was, I did not come across some documents. Maybe I was biased. I omitted something. Whatever it is, someone else comes up with, brings out those documents and my entire research and all the hard work of several years can be overturned on its head and the book can be thrown in the dustbin. And so that I think is the beauty. If everything about the past that we need to know is already known, then we go out of job. We have nothing to keep just reinventing the same st stupid stories. So I think this journey that uh, the research part is so interesting, which takes you on this journey of discovery and then um, mul uh, you know, meeting people in the course of this, uh, this uh, book itself, it was my own Bharat Jano Yatra of uh, knowing different parts of India. It's the season of Yatras now. So uh, everybody is going on some Yatra. So my own little rediscovery of India, of so many different parts of India, people, their rulers, their traditions and customs, which I thought was very interesting uh, to do. So that's what keeps you going. Otherwise, it becomes very, very boring. It's not just you go to a library, get a book and just... Uh, everything that is there is already to be uh, already published somewhere. That's not how it works. I know. I'm sure. Uh, you know. I think while researching on one book, I think the next ten books would pop up. Yeah. Uh, you know, trying to distract you <laughs> or <laughs> trying to build a backlist, and uh, so that uh, brings me to what are your you know the lessons or uh, insights that uh, you would like to share with the audience about turning your passion into profession. I know you spoke at length about research, which is crucial, but uh, turning a passion into profession uh, has so many aspects to it. Uh, you know, the whole dharmartha kamas have to align. Uh, so any insights that you would like to share? And I somehow selfishly hope that amongst this audience, I see a lot of young leaders who would be uh, inspired to delve into history again, uh, maintaining the legacy of uh, management, investment, and <laughs> history? Well, I don't know what else to say than what I already said about that. I think it's just, I'm just very grateful and blessed that very few people get that opportunity, I think, to make uh, what you said, your passion, your profession. And uh, the fact that that ha has happened and that, I've managed to survive even, you know, financially with, with making that your profession, which is lucrative enough to let you, uh, you know, survive. Uh, I think that's, that's nothing less than a blessing and it's only immense gratitude that I can think of. And, uh, I'll come back, come to the audience questions now. Uh, Rakesh uh, Arekere wants to ask uh, about how uh, you mentioned about history, the uh, ancient history is very cryptic about knowledge. So, and uh, it's so difficult to decipher. Uh, do you think casteism had some role to play, you know, making it so cryptic or, uh, you know, this, uh, did casteism extract such, such a deep cost? No, I, um, I don't think so. Because, I mean, some of the people who are Itihasas, the Puranas were written by people who we would today call as lower caste, uh, Valmiki or Vyasa. They were not of the Brahmin community. In fact, Ravana is the Bra uh, Brahmin there who is shown as the Asura. Mahishasura belongs to a, uh, a Brahminic uh, origin. And you have actually the Kshatriya, Rama uh, doing it. Krishna is from the uh, Yadava clan. So I don't know. I think a lot of study needs to happen on when exactly this caste system as we call it today. Was it again a construct which was done for census purposes? Was it for yes. that to classify? Because the West always loves to classify and uh, if, whether it's plants or humans. So you have to put uh, genus and this and that. So whether, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that whether when this actually originated, when did Varna and Jati and the, uh, the upward mobility, even what Krishna, we're talking about the Bhagavad Gita and I think Madan would be a better expert than I'm not on that. That he says that uh, the Varnas are uh, through your gunas and not through your uh, 
hereditariness or your janma. So you, you can be born a Brahmin, but your actions and your gunas may be that of what is called a Shudra and vice versa. So this mobility upward and downward was permitted. Uh, so And this whole notion of upward mobility is so, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, you know, take a typical Shudra, say, uh, ready. Uh, you know, who owns acres and acres of land, uh, why the, you know, why on earth he would like to take up any Brahminical role of going house to house and conducting rituals, you know, instead of, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, harvesting his own land, right? And uh, that brings me to two, if I can share, uh, Mahabharata has a wonderful story about a Brahmana called Kaushika. He goes uh, very proudly to ask for bhiksha to a uh, you know, to a, uh, to some house. And the lady of the house is busy, you know, in her own chores. And, uh, no, uh, yeah, before he goes, uh, you know, he has a bath and uh, a bird, uh, uh, you know, it uh, drops on him. And he looks at the bird uh, with a lot of anger and uh, the tapasya, uh, the, his, the strength of his tapasya is so strong that the bird burns into ash. And then he comes to very proud of his uh, power, Right, uh, he comes to this house, and uh, the lady of the house takes her own time to come and give him bhiksha because he's she's busy. I mean, she's not waiting to receive uh, you know un, uh, uninvited guests, right? And then he looks at her with the same anger, and she tells him, "I am not that crane to burn for you know to your stupid rage. You know, take your food and go." And then he's like, "How did you know about that incident?" Then she tells him, okay, if you really want to know about this nitty gritties of how dharma works, you know, I am, you know, my dharma protects me from, uh, you know, this un, uh, you know, badly placed anger that your tapasya would have given you. Uh, but if you really want to know about dharma, go to this butcher called Dharma Vyadha. He will tell you what dharma is. And so this Brahmana with lot of uh, tapasya, uh, you know, lot of powers with him had to go seeking knowledge from a butcher called Dharma Vyadha. And uh, then, uh, you know, speaking about the ready, uh, this one, I found this beautiful calendar of 2009 uh, by WMG where they had, uh, you know, highlighted uh, Prolaya Vema Reddy, uh, who is the founder of uh, Reddy Empire. And he proudly speaks about his Shudra origins and says, like Mother Ganga was born out of the feet of Lord Vishnu, my clan was born like Mother Ganga. And we will cleanse the impurity caused by these invasions, these Kuturkic invasions. That's what, you know, he declares in one of his inscriptions. And then he says, I am like Agastya, who swallowed the ocean. I am going to swallow Turkic invasions, Islamic invasions. And I am like Parashurama, who, uh, because he uh, gave away a lot of land to the Agraharas. And like Parashurama won the land but distributed it back, I am going to distribute this land that I won back from the invaders to uh, people who deserve it. And, uh, you know, he's a very proud Shudra. Uh, you know, what would you, I mean, why would he go for so-called upward mobi mobility where he's really on top? Uh, I mean, thank you for listening to these thoughts of mine. Vijay A.M., uh, wants to say, wants to ask, uh, even in modern history, why are, uh, why are we taught to read, uh, diary of Anne Frank and not war diary of Asha Sahai of Holocaust and not Bengal famine? <laughs> well, yes, the same answer of, of how we look at our past. I think in our growing up years, we don't realize, even I didn't uh, while kneeling down, that this is not just a subject which we learn by rote and vomit in exams and get some marks and go away. But the importance of history becomes uh, uh, cognizant to us as we grow up. It is that mirror in which we can identify ourselves as a civilization, as a people. It gives us a sense of identity. It's uh, till you know where you've come from, you don't know where to go ahead. And so the importance is, cannot be emphasized more. Uh, this, as I said, uh, consciously, unconsciously, subconsciously, whatever way, 
to give that sense of uh, you know what are the what are the elements of that past that you uh, make available to eh car had said history is all that uh, the historian actually makes available so there is so much only what is made available that is what is history so it is the historian subjectivity in letting out the information on everything including the freedom movement we are talking about modern indian history and uh, that's actually my more area of interest expertise than ancient and medieval because i think to be a good ancient or medieval indian historian unlike the eminences who are there in this country you need to know the languages you need to know sanskrit you need to know persian you need to know arabic we have all the eminences who proudly say i don't know a single word of that but still which other country will allow that i mean you can't be uh, you know uh, without knowing hebrew and latin and then say i'm a uh, expert on the history of those uh, regions and people but here it is allowed because you will then take a lost in translation and make something out of it so i don't even want to venture there because i honestly i don't know those languages but uh, you know modern indian history too and the freedom movement which gives us so much recency it gives us a sense of so there also the attenborough film you know frame to frame that is all that we know of our freedom struggle दे दी हमें आजादी बिना खडग बिना भाल साबरमती के संत तूने कर दिया कमाल विच इज ग्रेट एंड फाइन बट आई थिंक अलोंग साइड दिस नॉन वायलेंट मूवमेंट दे वॉज अडी आर्म रेवल्यूशन ऑल थ्रू इन दिस कंट्री वी डेंट कीप लाइंग डाउन इवन ड्यूरिंग दैट टाइम फ्रॉम एटीन फिफ्टी सेवन द फर्स्ट अपराइजिंग टू नाइनटीन फोर्टी सिक्स वी आर द नेवल म्यूटिनी देर वॉज एन अन एंडिंग चेन ऑफ uh violent uprisings in different parts the armed revolutionaries uh, and their role uh, if that story is mapped then a very different narrative of what the indian freedom struggle is comes uh, to mind um, and we probably would have got independence earlier so so many ifs and buts could uh, could be so, uh, supposition but uh, you know so a lot of this this is why did we not study this why were we not told this how were the revolutionaries shown in our history books that these were isolated acts of bravery by a few young men here and there hot blooded young people they threw some bomb here they shot some fellow and then they were just hanged and they went away and it's a footnote uh, so but what was the larger strategy of uh, the armed revolution and finally we've also won freedom because of the heroics of the indian national army netaji subhash chandra bose the naval mutiny and the british were dead scared of a repeat of 1857 that uh, you know if there is an insurrection in the british indian army uh, then the raj will collapse uh, and 1857 the carnage in kanpur and other places they did not want that to repeat and so in fact including the way the indian national congress was started by ao hume they used to call it the safety wall Uh, to ensure that you know you assuage the indians with a little bit of concessions here and there and they are sweet people they will come on board we should not uh, have a repeat of 1857 which the armed revolutionary is always right from the 1857 model also in a very primitive way was that that you know how do you create an insurrection in the army and once that is done then the might of the empire collapses uh and you know by the time of the second world war you had 2 and a half million indian soldiers in the british army uh, in 1945 out of that only about 10 12000 were europeans the rest of them were indians our people our color blood everything and they are fighting against us only and so these revolutionaries the strategy all through from lakshmi bai and hazrat mahal and tantya tope to subhash chandra bose to savarkar to the gadar party to bhagat singh to rash bihari bose all of them was this that a small percentage of this large number of indians who are in the army if they can be seduced to patriotism and you can be won over to the other side then you know the british cannot last and so what ina did was a culmination of those very efforts and that is why the british hurriedly left in a haste actually and gave us freedom left the scourge of partition and all of that but yeah so as i said once the narrative is told in a different way the flavor of the freedom movement itself is very different uh, but we the 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 history is a handmaiden of the victor and so uh, in fact in this book there's this lovely quote of chinua achebe uh, the nigerian author who says until the lions have found their storyteller the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter uh, and so in india unfortunately i think the 
it's always been a hunter's story. Slowly, our lions are squeaking now and trying to find their, the voice of a nation long suppressed finds a trance, as that famous speech goes. And uh, we hope the squeaks will grow into a roar soon. Uh, and, uh, you know, the hunters get scared. Uh, they are already scared, actually. Uh, I think you have al uh, already answered this. Uh, Ganesh, you know, I want to, I want to ask you, uh, does your research cover local folklore, those harikathas, pardanes, ballads, you know, which may point to some never before, uh, you know, known historical, uh, uh, yeah. I think uh, he has uh, elaborated enough on, the, you know, the whole uh, classical legends, you know, composed by the poets. Uh, Sudhama, we wants to ask why Krishna Devaraya is not included. Uh, is it because another dumbbell uh, he deserves? <laughs> no. no, I mean, this was like unknown, unsung. I don't know. We have, maybe we, even Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, why would he not be there yeah, in something yeah. like this? Mm -hmm. That's also a question. But largely throw light on people whose names also don't ring a bell. I think that is more important. The more near extinction, <laughs> you know, species, you protect them and then slowly move the torchlight towards other characters. Maybe that's how it is. So, a uh, long question by Suveer. I think, uh, you know, he wants to hint that, uh, you know, why the, uh, you know, didn't the downfall start as the first uh, shrinking of our geography happened with uh, the first invasions and, uh, uh, you know, what that kept on attracting more and more invaders. Uh, so when did the exact downfall start is what his trend. So that's also a very interesting question because uh, there is, uh, can I borrow the book? Uh, I don't have my own book, like a good author. But, uh, you know, there is this, uh, just give me a moment. You know, a lot of, uh, lot of times we are told that we were probably uh, socially decadent uh, and that is why we got invaded. We were disunited and all of that. But then when the Arab invasions happened in the uh, 7th and 8th centuries, some of the Arab chroniclers who came along, what did they have to say? Uh, you know, one such instance that I quote here, Arab cartographer Muhammad al-Idrisi, he notes, and I quote his translation, the Indians are naturally inclined to justice. They never depart from it in their actions. Their good faith, honesty, and fidelity to their engagements are well known, and they are so famous for these qualities that people flock to their country from every side, and hence the country is flourishing and their condition is so prosperous. Unquote. So, you know, this was a foreign chronicler coming with the invader. So he had no reason to eulogize us. Uh, but if he is saying that, and there are several others like that, which kind of was it the uh, chicken and egg problem? Did society become decadent because of the invasions and successive invasions? Or was prosperity was what drew, drew uh, invaders to this land? And there too, invasions we sp speak of, within a few decades after the passing away of the Holy Prophet, you had the Islamic empire establishing itself widely in the Central uh, Asia, in Northern Africa, and the caliphate, uh, the sword of Islam, so to say, uh, ranged from the uh, Atlantic uh, on the west to the very gates of India on the east. All those uh, places, you know, the, the Babinian empire, the Sassanid empire, all of them collapsed so quickly. But it took 500 years for an Islamic sultanate to get established in India. Uh, from 600 and something, 36, I think, when the first invasion of Sindh happened, even that, for 70 years, Chacha and his son, Dahar, ensured that they were repelled. And it was only in 712, when Muhammad bin Qasim comes, that finally Debal uh, in Sindh collapses. And even then, the Sindh, uh, beyond that narrow strip of what is Sindh today, the Arabs were not able to conquer vast parts of India, not because they didn't try. They tried every means to send new, new, you know, armies and governors. But you had confederacies that were forming, which we, again, we are not told of. Uh, you know, like there was Bappa Rawal, there was Jaya Bhatta, there was Pulakeshin uh, of uh, um, the Chalukya Vikramaditya 
danti durga the rashtrakuta they formed a grand alliance of the west center south uh, kingdoms to repel the arabs uh, yashovarman and lalita ditya who were otherwise uh, rivals they combined hands and pushed uh, the arabs away so the arabs never managed to conquer uh, india uh, though they tried and the turks also came mohammad ghazni ghori all these people ghori also i mean i speak about rani naiki devi of gujarat who you know being a woman regent queen of a infant child of the chalukya solanki kingdom of gujarat she defeated mohammad ghori in what was known as the battle of kasarhada in 1178 so much so that ghori was so humiliated to be vanquished by a lady that he never came back to gujarat again which i'm sure none of us would no, have read about know. it uh, in history but forget none of us here even her own t- contemporaries who wrote the history of gujarat during her time uh, you know jaina accounts sanskrit accounts in whether it was in jaina in prakrit meru tunga somashekhara all these people who wrote so disparagingly and condescendingly they write that uh, the hammira or ghori uh, hammira he was so weak that even a woman could defeat him <laughs> you know not uh, saying that she was brave or she had strategy or whatever if he were if he was strong then this lady could not, not have done much so that also tells of how we look at uh, women in power and all of that uh, you know which is sad but uh, but but then we did give this um, you know knock back for a significant amount of time but after i think repeated attacks uh, parts of uh, you know india collapsed and it's not always a glorious picture that every time everyone uh, join hand there was disunity naiki devi herself you know sends out emissaries to prithviraj chauhan uh, saying you know we have this man at our frontier so let's all join hands and give a bloody nose to him prithviraj chauhan refuses to join hands uh and he pays the price 1178 you had the kasarhada battle where she wins but 1191 few years later the battle of tarain and so on 91 92 the again i will be kneeling down for not knowing the exact date uh but the, he he uh, loses uh, to ghori and he pays a price for it so there are uh, two sides of the coin there were times when we united there were also times when we disunited i think the latter should be the lessons for us today when exactly this started happening i think around that time the 13th century onwards and then a, but then never was the whole of india conquered in the way till perhaps even the later mughals or the early you know the east india company we still there were pockets of resistance all the time even in the heights of mughal empire whether it was aurangzeb or akbar you had rebellions all over the place all the time of the empire of the of delhi was only in crushing whether it was a deccan whether it was bengal whether it was gujarat whether it was different parts of uh, the country um, so it was not a complete collapse but yeah after that initial high period and 500 years is not a small period to maintain that resistance we did uh, start failing and i think those periods and those lessons are very important for us as a civilization to see today thank you uh, it's I'm sad to be ending this very wonderful conversation I think you know given an opportunity we could go on and on and on uh, so thank you for this uh, you know wonderful exposition of how we should look at history and how history is so relevant whether we are you know pursuing business or you know irrespective of the profession we have so so many timeless lessons so thanks again thank uh, vikram and uh, thank you audience thank you everyone on a weekday evening as uh, she said braving bangalore traffic coming here and sitting with rapt attention to what is otherwise termed boring history i think uh, yeah i somewhere feel i've done that school teacher proud by <laughs> keeping <laughs> some interest alive <laughs> in history so thank you everyone thank you for the wonderful questions to rajesh to wmg for inviting me it's been such a great pleasure and i hope to see you all again soon thank you